All right, well, I had warned you, did I not? Those of you who had not yet read on fairy stories or leaf by niggle, but had been nourished on Tolkien, did not really see these coming. And so consequently, what we're getting, it seems to me, is an introduction, first and foremost, to Tolkien the Professor, right? As you read that, that lecture turned essay on fairy stories, what you're getting really is a kind of glimpse into the sort of professorial conduct that Tolkien was basically practicing throughout a great portion of his career. But you will notice one significant difference, I trust, and that is that he is singularly interested in the end, after talking about the many things that he talks about in the essay, he is interested in the end in talking about creation and creativity. Right? So he's not just an analyst, though when I say that I think to myself, well, there's nothing wrong with being just an analyst. Of course there isn't. But to be just an analyst is not to be Tolkien. Right? So he's an analyst as well as a creative writer, and one would have to argue that his analysis has enriched his creative writing, but at the same time one would have to say his creative writing has enriched his analysis. It's uh, what we used to call a win-win, right? All right, so as you were reading this essay, first of all, we'll get to Leaf by Niggle in a while. As you were reading this essay, of course, as I said, you were glimpsing Tolkien the professor, but you were glimpsing a particular kind of professor, it seems to me, um, one who is garrulous, multiply referential, someone who loves to drop casual allusions because, of course, he seems to have judged his audience. These are people who have read most of the stuff that he has read, or additionally, he is devoted to inciting them to read it. That makes it very discursive, the term that's usually applied to an essay of this kind. It's very discursive. And if you were to summarize the essay for me, bless you, John. If you were to summarize the essay for me, would you find that easy to do? I can sit here and I can give you point one and point two and point three and point four, all the evidence that goes into each one, yes? I found in the <laughs> beginning it was more yes. what it was not. And then yes. once in the epilogue, That's I right. more clearly found out what it yes. was. And also in the epilogue, he kind of, I found he kind of tied it to his religion. Well, way. he did, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yes, you're quite yeah. right. And that is, of course, an inescapable mm -hmm. or inevitable direction for Tolkien to go when he ultimately talks about creativity and about the components of the fairy story, which he considers to be definitive as well as indispensable. But you're quite right. When we begin, he begins by talking about what a fairy story is not, primarily. Certainly, he says, it can be a story about fairies. It certainly can be that. But Betsy, that's not enough for him for at least two reasons. Why is it not only a story about fairies? There might be two very good reasons. Go ahead, please, if you like. Yes. There's way more than just fairies. <laughs> that's right. And you emphasize the term fairyland. Right? Because for Tolkien, fairy stories are about fairy land. They're not exclusively or even predominantly about fairies. That's point one. Point two would be fairies themselves. Of course, I come tripping into class and I say, class, class, today we're reading about fairies. What's the first thing that jumps to mind out of your childhood reading? Go ahead, yeah, they're tiny, right? And they have wings and maybe even as Tolkien mentions, they have antennae and they flip from cowslip to cowslip, and they use things like wasp stings for spears when they have their diminutive little wars down among the, gla the, the, the grass blades. But none of that, he says, really betokens or is betokened by the terms fairy or the landscapes of fairy land or any of the other issues that he associates in his own practice with the concept of fairy or fairy, right? Two different spellings. So if they're not diminutive little entities with wings that flip from flower to flower and use wasp stings as their spears, what then 
are they? That becomes one of the central questions of the essay. Why do we have what he calls this detestable, right, a strong word for Tolkien, this, this detestable tradition of diminutive fairies with wings? Why do we have that tradition? Go ahead, please, yes. Well, Tolkien says that the English enjoyed the daintiness. <laughs> right? He says, uh, there are two points. This is the second one. The second one is, there's a certain literary finesse, that's the term that he uses, a sense of the dainty, we might also say the whimsical, but all of that is associated in his mind essentially with the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It's a Victorian, Edwardian type of fantasy where everything has become insufferably precious. This is the period when the English, for example, start using cutesy nicknames for one another. So someone whose name is Brickell might end up being called Bicky, right? Which is an abbreviation for the word biscuit. So we have these cutesy nicknames which are themselves diminutive and reductive. Tolkien doesn't like any of that. He particularly despises Michael Drayton's Nymphidia. I presume you stumbled across that as you were reading the essay. What is it about Nymphidia that he particularly despises? It's all those diminutive little elves, but what else? This is what he's consciously trying not to do in his own work and it's what he's using very consciously to define in contrast to his conception of fairy story. What is it about Michael Drayton's Nymphidia, a 17th century narrative poem in which these figures appear? What is it in addition to the fairies themselves that he so detests? He says um, he tries to be funny but fails completely. Yes, that's right. Or we might also, he tries to be cute yeah. and fails. Well, in what way does he fail in addition to making the fairies diminutive? It's like the rhyming, the little yes. section that he has this terrible. Yes, that's right. He says it's one of the worst examples of fairy stories as it were gone awry, gone astray. So he singles out Michael Drayton, but Michael Drayton for him represents an entire chunk of the fairy story tradition that he wants to upend and throw into the Thames, right? What does he want in its place? What does he think fairy and fairy story truly are? You mentioned, for example, you sort of jumping to the, to the conclusion very productively because we can then apply that backwards through the essay. Of course, certainly, in the end, it takes him to his religion, all things in his life because of his devoutness take him back to his religion. That's fine, that's a component of who Tolkien is. But there is so much involved here in the actual definition, the identification and characterization of fairy story that is not only interesting in itself, but is more or less infinitely applicable to everything that he himself would write on the creative side of his career. So what is it about fairy stories? that he finds worthwhile. What is it about fairy stories and fairy? Something about a turn. Say again, please. Something about a turn. Yes, that's right. One of the things he is most concerned about is not so much their origin, their background, or in the case of, of Michael Drayton, their sort of perversion. Although origins interest him. He's a philologist, right? He is a person who studies language history scientifically, and he was a good one. He's a very accomplished philologist. So he's interested in origins. It's just that he's skeptical of some of the kinds of <coughs> origins that are cited for fairy story and for related categories like myth and even really skeptical of those things. So he's not uninterested in origins, but he's really, he says, much more interested in effects. A fairy story, whatever its origin or history or background, and it's sure to have one, would also have certain characteristic effects.
And that, in the end, is really what he wants to get at. What is the effect, or what are the effects of fairy stories? Yes, James? He gives a list of, I think, four things yes. of fairy stories. Yes, as a matter of fact, he does, yes, right? So he goes through what he sort of thinks of as the indispensable or inevitable components of the fairy story in relation to its effects. Yes, yes, of course, we can pursue history. We can um, sort of talk about how the definitions of fairy story have been too restrictive or how they've been too reductive and so on, how it has gone astray. But as he begins to zero in on his conceptions of this matter, having told us in essence what they are not, is the Lilliput chapter in Gulliver's Travels a fairy story. No, it isn't. He says it's a traveler's tale, right? It's a traveler's tale and it's filled with particular kinds of wonders and devoted to the particular kinds of purposes that traveler's tales are devoted to. Could it be a fairy story? Ah, that's a more complicated question, yes? It could be a fairy story. It just doesn't happen to be in the form that we have it. So when he talks about effects rather than origins, he mentions, of course, that our primary audience for the last several generations has been rather restricted when it comes to fairy stories. Restricted in what way? Go ahead. Yes, please. Me? Yes, please. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, children. Yes. Why does that bother him? Children. Yes? He thinks that they can be misused by children. Yes. They go to children because they're like old furniture. And <laughs> they don't that's things. right. Yeah, well, that's, that's really the fundamental point. What he sees or imagines to have happened is that at some point in the history of these kinds of narratives, grown ups got a different conception of themselves and they developed a different conception of children like all of the other things associated in the early part of his discussion with the dismissal of fairy stories, so too, he says, basically, <coughs> pardon me, children became the receptacles of the cutesy, right? They became precious, and they became immature, and their judgments became questionable. The distinction he draws is that adults purveying fairy stories to children as if they belonged exclusively to children are exploiting children's credulity, right? Their inclination, as they see it, to believe credulity. And what he wants to emphasize, A, is that since he already at this time has several children and knows what he's talking about from direct experience, children are not singularly affected with by credulity. People underestimate them, he seems to hint. And that children are much more sophisticated apprehenders of narrative than adults nowadays are inclined to give them credit for, right? So he says that he, as a child already, despised the cutesy aspects of the stories that were given to him as fairy stories. And he says his own children felt the same revulsion. Now, it's possible he taught them that, but who taught him, right? So there must be something to his point that these tales, as we now currently understand fairy stories for children, are repellent at least to intelligent children. What he's really after is this notion that he coins of secondary belief. That's distinct from credulity, right? Credulity is simply a kind of blind and obedient passion to believe, right? Secondary belief is something else entirely. And he says we're all capable of it, children too. What exactly is secondary belief? Secondary belief. Do we go reading through any kind of fantastical tale, to use another term that he uses in parallel? Do we go through any kind of fantastical 
tail saying. I often irritate my wife by doing this when sci-fi programs are on and we're watching them. And I don't actually mean to irritate her, I just think it's funny and I'm, I'm obviously never as funny as I believe I am. We look at something and in the background there's an obvious computer projection of something and I always say, that's fake! Mm -hmm. right? But the truth of the matter is I just do that for fun because I'm watching because I enjoy by way of secondary belief what is happening in the narrative. Right? What exactly is then secondary Belief. We don't go through a tale saying that's fake. Go ahead. Um, for lack of a better term, it's the suspension of disbelief. Right. He does actually quote Samuel Taylor Coleridge in deploying that term, but he's not even fully satisfied with suspension of disbelief. Right. It's a valuable precursor to secondary belief, perhaps, but it entails a certain artificial and mechanical turn of mind. You say to yourself. I'm going to believe this for now. That would be suspension of disbelief, right? So I'm glad you mentioned that term because he does distinguish secondary belief in part from it. Secondary belief is more complicated. Go ahead. Um, it's the belief in the set of rules that governs yes. the fantastic Right. Rules. What you do, he doesn't use these terms, and I doubt that he would, but you make a kind of contract with the author. And notice I say, author because Tolkien tells us something very interesting about the art of the fairy story what is its most effective form of conveyance it's a genre Danielle yeah nowadays we wouldn't balk at saying oh that's a f that's a fairy story painting or that's a fantasy painting right but Tolkien does why uh, he says that if it's a visual art, so photography, yes, yes. drama, and painting, mm -hmm. um, since it isn't created by the person mm -hmm. who's reading it, mm -hmm. it's not as effective right. as real. It's sort of like the effect you get when you go to see a movie yes. of a book. Yes. The creation that's yes. on the screen it's is less like, compelling and less convincing than the one art which is most effectively deployed for fairy stories, and that would be, of course. That would be narrative prose, or sometimes poetic narrative as well, right? It's words. And of course the philologist would say that, wouldn't he? But the argument he makes is at the very least a plausible one. We can give it some credit. It is most effectively done with words, not in other art forms. So the willing suspension of disbelief and secondary belief would entail a contract you sort of semi-consciously make with the author of a narrative in words. And in that contract, you would basically stipulate, I'm entering the world you have made. You are establishing the rules by which that secondary world is governed. And so long as, and here of course is an important point, so long as the rules are consistent. So long as the laws can be made to seem characteristic of that world and orderly in themselves within that framework, then I will agree to practice secondary belief. Do we know the difference between a primary belief and a secondary belief? Do we know the difference between the real world, as we call it, and the world of the literary work? Of course we do. Right? Of course we do. And there's an old, old critical dictum in English literature that goes back at least to Samuel Johnson, who, though he was writing about the theater, said something very pertinent. From time to time, literary critics, I won't even dignify them with the name, they're mostly just critics, look at literature or other fictitious kinds of artistic productions and they say that's a pack of lies. It's like me saying that's fake, right? Only I'm doing it for fun and they're doing it because they're mean-spirited. And they say that's a pack of lies. And periodically someone has to come forward, someone like Sir Philip Sidney or Samuel Johnson or Percy Shelley will have to come forward and will have to say there's a reason that we tell stories that are distinct from what we think of as the primary real world, where a rock falling on your head knocks you out, right? 
there's a reason we have these things. And people who look at a work of art, literary or dramatic, and say of it, that's a pack of lies. Because, for example, in the, in the case of theater, the, uh, Shakespearean theater in particular, how could you at one moment be in Verona and in the next moment be in Padua, which is miles away? How could that be? Or how could you be in Egypt and then in Rome within the space of a two and a half hour dramatic production? How could that be? That's a pack of lies. It doesn't work. To which Samuel Johnson, in his wonderful pragmatic way, says, the audience are always in their senses. They know they're sitting in the theater. They know that the stage is a setting. They know that the actors are acting. It doesn't matter that it's make-believe. So we're not, in fact, being deceived by this. We're not being misled by it. We're certainly not being harmed by the fact that it's fiction. So secondary belief is that process whereby we are always in our senses, but we have agreed to enter this world for a variety of purposes, perhaps entertainment first and foremost. We've agreed to enter this world, and so long as it works internally, we will believe it at a secondary level. So, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Because the secondary belief. Yeah. I got tripped up with the Korean drama. The, yes. Yeah, yeah. That concept confused me. Because yes. Tolkien believes that men are the creators of yes. the fairy world, and yes. so without men, it can't exist. That's right. But the Korean drama is something put on by. Fairyland for well, yes, that is that is an elaborate passage. Let me just simplify to the main point, may I? Okay. <clears throat> what he says in essence is that if elves and fairies really did exist, right? He says they're inventions of human beings and they have distinctive purposes in the world of secondary belief, right? But if they did exist, they would probably write much different stories about us than we write about them. So that's partly why that, that confusion enters into the, uh, the discussion of the drama. His real point with respect to the drama is that from our side of things, the human side of things, it can't really ever be a successful depiction of fairy. And the reason is magic or enchantment. Think of putting on a dramatic production as opposed to reading a text. And remember, I mean, Tolkien's very much a reader, right? He is invested in language at every level of his career, so for him the text is the thing. Imagine witnessing a production in which magic and enchantment are meant to occur, to be depicted. But you see it on the stage. And contrast that with reading about it in the book. What is the difference, according to Tolkien? It's a very significant one for him. Go ahead. The stage already has an enchantment. Yes. We're already seeing a world that isn't yes. really there. That's right. So then seeing another part of that yes. world that's like a third yes. creation yes. there. It, it puts an unnecessary level of strain on our secondary belief. It induces tertiary belief or seeks to. And he seems to believe that that simply is not possible. In purely practical or pragmatic terms, what it amounts to is that no stage machinery, no mechanism, no special effect with respect to the stage that he would have known in 1938. None of that machinery adequately represents magic or enchantment. In fact, he actually detests likewise all such machinery that seeks to create an impression of magic or enchantment. For him, it's narrative and narrative almost exclusively. Now, you might want to ask, therefore, in that context, why is Leaf by Niggle about a painting? Yeah? <laughs> but we'll get to that in just a little while. So you see, all of these, in the end, are questions about the possible 
in any case, right? We go into the world and we say this is possible or this is not possible. Its internal rules are consistent or they are not consistent. And if they're not consistent, we're disappointed with it. The secondary belief shatters. We emerge from that world unhappy, unsatisfied, and not even entertained, particularly. But those are questions in part of the possible. For him, really, the central function of the fairy story is to address itself to the desirable, not merely the possible. If we're sitting there saying, that's fake, of course it's failing. But much more importantly, what he says it must address itself to, what inevitably it does address itself to, is the desirable. Can you explain or help me to understand what he means by the desirable and by desire? Our use of the term desire has gone a pejorative diminishment, has it not? Right? It has shrunk to mean almost exclusively sexual desire, and that is not what he means at all. He's talking about the older sense, the more expansive sense of desire, desirability. What is he addressing there? <coughs> what is your sense of what he means by the desirable desire? Go ahead, please, if you like. Um, fulfillment, Say again? Fulfillment? Yes. How so? Um, what, are, what is the nature of these desires, for example? I'm trying to say that we, when we go into a story, we're looking for something that speaks to us yes. and fulfills something that's speaking yes. in our mind. Yes, that's right. And he says some of these desires are primordial. That's the term that he uses. They are so ancient that they must surely in some sense be part of our long-term cultural makeup or even conceivably our genetic makeup, right? They are so ancient. He uses the word primordial. And among them, for example, would be the desire to fly silently without a machine. Notice how many times in Tolkien's discourse generally, but here in particular, he sort of rages against the machine, sometimes quietly, sometimes more noisily. He doesn't like mechanisms. He doesn't like artificial, clunky, gear-driven, noisy kinds of things. His family owned a car for a very short period of time, and he came to detest what he here calls the noise and stench of internal combustion engines. To say nothing, by the way, early ecologists, to say nothing of their wastefulness. So he hated machines, by and large. He hated machines in particular that were projections of power and domination. It's not just that he's a Luddite or a kind of nostalgic Ruskinite yearning for the 19th century's view of a pre-mechanized Middle Ages. No, it's more complicated than that. He's talking about the problems associated with machines used for evil purposes, power and domination. So the desirable is not attainable by machines. Our primordial desires, in fact, exclude machines, if indeed they are worthy. We may have a primordial desire for power. That's possible. And he would argue that would be part of our fallen nature, right? But for the most part, the things that we desire that are addressed by fairy stories, our ancient desires to be able to do things or, experiencing, uh, or experience things without the intervention of mechanism. Right? So to fly like birds, silently, gracefully, beautifully, as in nature. To survey the depths of time and space. Well, H.G. Wells' time machine could have provided him an opportunity to do that, and he references the time machine at least three times in this essay in various contexts. Why would that not be gratifying to him, though? The answer's in the title, right? It's a time machine. It's not a fulfillment of a primordial desire to survey the depths of time and space. That's a power that would be granted by enchantment. And as he says, grace, it would be a gift given to us by a greater power than ourselves. So the desirable is that which we seem quite naturally and in the most ancient terms to desire 
to wish for, to seek, without the intervention of a machine. A narrative of this kind, therefore, interestingly, would somehow intuit those desires, would it not? You understand what I'm asking? The author of, an, of, a, a, of a fairy story, a fantasy, would intuit those desires. He would know what they are. He would be able to, he or she, would be able to assess the audience, value them as human beings, and say in the execution of his project, I know what these people want. I know what their primordial desires are. And he may know them when we don't. How many of you ever actually thought in analytical terms of a desire to survey the depths of time and space? Never, in all likelihood. But now that I've said it, quoting Tolkien, can you see how the fairy story also would be deployed to awaken a desire we didn't know we had? <laughs> exactly. So he says in point of fact, a fairy story will both awaken that desire, will incite it, and it will seek, and if it's successful, it will do so, it will seek to satisfy that desire. We will have, in other words, a narrative in which our desire to survey the depths of time and space, or other desires we'll talk about in a moment, would be gratified in some way. Would we be made capable then of surveying those depths ever after in real terms? You understand the distinction I'm making here? Would we then be some would we then be transformed into people who can rise to a cosmic position and look at the universe from beginning to end in every tiny crevice? of its existence. Of course not. That's not what he's aiming at. That's not what he says is made possible by a fairy story. It satisfies desire in a very different kind of way. It gives us a glimpse. It opens out to us for just a moment through a crack, a gap, a doorway, a sudden flash of light. that Shakespeare describes, of course, as having ceased to be ere one can say it lightens. Mm -hmm. But just a glimpse. One might even think of it as in part tantalizing. So there's a curious component in his definition of satisfaction. What would be the nature of such a satisfaction. It does not propel us into the cosmos with godlike vision and truly enable us to see the depths of time and space. What does it do? Go ahead. Um. Gives us that glimpse. What is that good for? Yes, that's right. Yes, right. It helps us internalize. Yes, I think all of that is quite true. What it does is validate our suspicion that it existed all along. It tells us that yeah, it's there. We don't have the power always to see it. We don't have the power to control or manipulate it. That belongs to a higher power than ourselves. But when we glimpse it through fantasy, we know that it is. We know that it exists. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. sorry, that's all right. So the glimpse is also, in an almost paradoxical way, the proof and the tantalus of the truth, right? Just a glimpse. Let's have a look, if we could, for just a moment, at page 63. I hope we all have the same pagination in this particular case. Notice how he chronicles, my page 63 begins with poetry and arithmetic because they like these things. Most of you have that? Okay. 
Uh, can you follow on with the neighbor perhaps? And then maybe you can find the passage uh, on your own a little bit later. All right, in the middle of that same page, there is a passage that reads, fairy stories were plainly not primarily concerned with possibility, but with desirability. If they awaken desire, satisfying it while often whetting it unbearably, there it is, the gratification and the tantalus. They succeeded. And then he gives us, as it were, a kind of developmental history in his own autobiography of these matters. It is not necessary to be more explicit here, for I hope to say something later about this desire, a complex of many ingredients, some universal, some particular to modern men, including modern children, or even to certain kinds of men. I had no desire to have either dreams or adventures like Alice, and the amount of them merely amused me. I had very little desire to look for buried treasure or fight pirates, and Treasure Island left me cool. And this is where he uses that term, Red Indians. Red Indians were better. There were bows and arrows. I had and have a wholly unsatisfied desire to shoot well with the bow, and strange languages and glimpses of an archaic mode of life, and above all, forests in such stories. But the land of Merlin and Arthur was better than these, and best of all, the nameless north of Sigurd of the Volsungs and the prince of all dragons. Such lands were preeminently desirable. And later in that passage, he will say, I desire dragons with a profound desire. Is he ever going to get them? Only in a fantasy story, only in fairy, right? But they're there. So we have him telling us with increasingly inclusive autobiographical detail how he came to this particular realization. And then at the bottom of 64, he tells us the poignant component of this. If you know anything about his biography, you will understand why, and I'll explain in a moment. He certainly says in that last paragraph, I like many other things, history, astronomy, botany, grammar, and so on and so forth. But he says at the bottom of that page, a real taste for fairy stories was wakened by philology on the threshold of manhood when he was an undergraduate and quickened to full life by war. What's he talking about? Um, yeah, indeed he did, right? So as an undergraduate, he began to study philology, Germanic philology very specifically. But that academic career was interrupted by World War I, in which he enlisted as, I think, a second lieutenant. He fought at the Battle of the Somme, came down with trench fever, and was invalided home consequently. But he had seen it, and he had seen, in fact, at the Somme, some of the worst of it. So here we have him then telling us also poignantly that he came to this in part because he had directly experienced warfare. This also, of course, sets us up for the four elements that you were talking about, right? If these are the experiences that he had, if these are what brought him to fairy story, his conception of the function and effects of fairy story. Those four elements, fantasy itself, recovery, escape, and consolation. Discussion of those four elements constitute, in fact, the greatest single chunk of the essay, right? And for him, these are the important things. All right, so fantasy we've already begun to talk about. I think we understand what he means by what the, the, the nature of fantasy and how it works. Recovery is an important component because it's related to that sudden glimpse we talked about a while ago but it's rooted in the familiar. Just like fantasy itself, just like fairy stories, they're actually rooted in the familiar. And recovery in that sense is no different. What does he mean by it? Recovery. It implies something lost, doesn't it? Go ahead. I thought it meant um, recovery like a sense of wonder. Yes, exactly, right? What we have, what has happened to us very frequently as a consequence of familiarity with things is that we have ceased to experience wonder in their presence, right? They have ceased to enchant us. But now we need to understand what lies behind this particular concern. 
It's not only an, a kind of inherited concern that as the world becomes increasingly mechanized, it becomes increasingly secular, and in the end increasingly ungratifying. That's part of it to be sure. But for Tolkien, the world itself is an enchanted place. And human experiences of the ordinary kind, which become too familiar, make us forget that. What's enchanted about it in Tolkien's terms? Very important to understand Tolkien's terms here. What's enchanted about the real world? Does, yeah, you, young man, I'm sorry. Uh, enchanted about the real world? Yeah, what's enchanting or enchanted about the real world? We're out in it every day. You know, we, we knock on things and we walk and we hear the, the birds singing and, and, and we feel the wind blowing and so on and so forth. And it becomes ordinary to us. But for Tolkien, we need to be reminded through this process of recovery that that's actually an enchantment. How so? Um, Where did that world come from in Tolkien's view? The real world we inhabit came from somewhere. Where did it come from? From our, like, our imagination. In part, yes, of course, right? We, we created ourselves yeah. in part by imagining it and interacting with it. But that is reflective of our role in it. In a sense, it pre-exists us and we are placed in it. Placed there by whom? Go ahead, please. Well, yes, right. This world is enchanted and we often forget that. It's enchanted because it was made by the Supreme Being. It was made by His inscrutable methods and for His inscrutable purposes. And He placed us here after making us as well. This is Tolkien's view. So recovery is recollection that we inhabit a place made by a being far superior to us. And everything that He made from the greatest to the smallest is a reflex of that enchantment, of that making, of that incantation, if you like. But it's fallen, let us remember. It's a fallen world in Tolkien's. Remember I said he's a very devout Catholic and very sincere in his belief and very orderly and systematic in his convictions. It's not like he's you know, one of those frightened peasants who's afraid of going to hell, and so he says he believes. No, no, no. He's an intellectual who has studied the matter very, very deeply and has arrived at his convictions by analysis and thoughtfulness, right? So he believes it's a fallen world. It's fallen not because God is flawed in some way, but because we are, right? We misused our freedoms to choose. And because it's fallen, that's partly the cause of our forgetfulness, but it's also the driver for the third component, for escape. In a fallen world, it's more difficult for us perhaps to, to answer this question, but in a fallen world, say in 1938, in England, what is the experience of humankind? Would you say it's sort of infinitely joyous and celebratory? <laughs> Leah, you look skeptical. Why not? I mean, <laughs> there's hardship. Of course, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, this induces his friend C.S. Lewis to study suffering. Right? Why is there suffering? Why does God allow suffering? And in point of fact, escape is partly an escape from suffering, right? It's a way to enter a created world where perhaps through the suffering of others, your own suffering begins to make a certain sense. Or in its most extreme forms, I suppose you could enter into a world without suffering, but that would seem really quite incredible, wouldn't it? But escape is more than that. Go ahead, please. You also have the great escape? Please. Yes. This is, yes. It really also means escape from our limitations. Right? What fantasy, what fairy stories might permit us to do, if they work effectively as they should, is grant us an opportunity through secondary belief and experience to escape our own limitations, if, even if only briefly, even if only in fiction. And by that process, as also with suffering, to come back to our world and understand our limitations too. Right? We can continue to be grieved or oppressed by them. Yes, of course, limitations have that effect. 
but we also perhaps understand them better as we understand suffering better. And it, when you mentioned the Great Escape, which he capitalizes, right? And this, of course, then, we'll have to just let this be the final word on the essay. This, of course, then gives him the occasion to move more explicitly into a description and characterization of his religious stance, right? What would the Great Escape be? We have a number of lesser escapes, obviously, but then we have the Great Escape. What's the Great Escape, James? The Great Escape is the escape of death. Yes. Is death, the capital D. Yes, right? So yeah. Totally our, our mortality, right? First and foremost, stories in fairy can put us in contact with entities that are deathless, entities that do not die in the sense that we understand dying. In his works, of course, elves, as you know, can be killed physically, but they're also capable of reincarnation. I don't know if most of you know that or not. They're capable of reincarnation. So they're never technically eradicated from the created universe. And fairy stories permit us then to encounter such beings and assess our own mortality in the process. So at once, it excites our desire for immortality it helps us to understand our mortality and it gives us a brief glimpse of some dimension which is beyond both mortality and immortality. And that brings us to his religion. And actually that brings us to his one explicitly allegorical story. In the 1965 foreword, to the Lord of the Rings, one of the things he says is that he cordially detests allegory. He was not a big fan, as I understand, I'm not a C.S. Lewis scholar, but as I understand it, he was not a big fan of the Narnia books, for example. For him, they were too allegorical, yeah. But this is an explicitly allegorical story. And it is in part meant to illustrate principles that are laid out in the essay on fairy stories. And again, if you've read Tolkien before, you know it's not like anything else that you've encountered in Tolkien. And I will give one proviso with that as we go forward. Okay, remember there's one proviso. You recognize the allegory. Can you lay it out for me? What is the allegory? What is the story about? It is a fantasy, it's a fairy story. The Life of Nickel? Say again? Are you talking, you're asking about the Life of Oh, about Leaf by Nickel, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was about him waiting for this journey, which is like death. He was right, waiting for exactly. death. He was trying to yes. put it off, put it off. He was trying as to we do, all do. Yeah. Is, is yes, and he was trying to do things that he wanted to do, but he was yes. trying to be considerate of his neighbors. Yes. And then even he, though he wasn't particularly generous exactly or gracious no. about it. And then whenever death came, he was ill prepared. That's right. Ill equipped. <laughs> right. And then he. Wait, well, that's a touch of every man, doesn't yes. it? Right. That's a touch of every man. That wonderful medieval drama about very closely related issues. And then he goes to purgatory, or the, the yeah, and you, yeah, I think you correctly interpret that on one purgatory. level as purgatory, right? Because clearly when he takes his train, <laughs> right, the train drops him not in heaven manifestly, but in a place very much like home, only maybe a little bit prettier, where nevertheless he has to work really, really hard, yeah? <laughs> and thus, in working, he comes to understand some of his shortcomings as a human being while alive. Michael, you wanted to add? No, uh, James? Um, that was good. Yeah, so I mean, in the end, it's a story about redemption and just as importantly about understanding redemption. Tell me about the two voices that speak and pass judgment on Nagel. What are the two voices, would you say? Again, I don't wish to treat this reductively with saying, well, you know, A is B and therefore B is C and so on and so forth. But there is, I mean, a, a manifest kind of concern here. The two voices seem to be justice and mercy. Yes, I think that's one very good way of putting it. They're abstractions which might be defined as justice. That's the stern voice, right? You owe me an account of your doings. But then there's also mercy that says there are mitigating factors. And mercy is that curious quality that all hope for and few expect, right? When it comes, it comes unexpectedly. When it speaks in its voice, it speaks almost unconvincingly. Justice is only reluctantly persuaded to let Nigel move on, right? So I mean, I, we could also define them as God the Father and God the Son, could 
right? And the whole story being suffused then in Catholic terms by the Holy Spirit, which is grace. So it's a story about redemption. It's a story about what he in the essay calls the you catastrophe, the sudden joyous turn. Here's Nigel disappointed in life by not being able to finish his painting, ending up in a place where he has to do all kinds of work, including work that he neglected while he was alive. And it turns out, of course, that the voice of mercy assesses this, persuades justice, and conjoins him with the very person whom he had casually abused, right? And so there's multiple redemption in the narrative. Forgiveness, comradeship, what we might think of as, uh, in Tolkien's terms, perhaps Christian confraternity, right? These two souls coming together and realizing that each completes the other. And you will remember that Tolkien had said these sudden joyous turns very often move us to tears. And as you're reading that story, I'd be surprised if some of you at least were not moved to tears by the appearance of Parrish, by his sudden understanding of his own shortcomings, Niggle's explanation, his final understanding, and so on. So these are all really, you know, and I say that as a hardened old sinner and a non-believer, I think it's absolutely beautiful. Right? Okay, well, anyway, that's kind of where we get to then in the application of on fairy stories. And we can proceed now with some of Tolkien's other talents. He's quite a delightful satirist, though many people, and a comedian, though many people also don't know that. So next time we'll read Farmer Giles and see how that sorts out for us. All right, thank you. <laughs>